G'day, welcome back to the edit room and a rant. I've got my ranty chair specially moved into the edit room so I can talk to you about something that's really important if you live in the US. Uh, if you live in America, uh, then this is something that was a, what do they call it, a counter UAS measure, a counter UAS roundtable discussion of the aviation subcommittee in the house. <laughs> what a load of palaver. Anyway, what was it all about? Well, it was a bunch of politicians and a bunch of people with vested interests from the industry, that is the drone industry, from the FAA, from uh, the Department of Defense. There was a whole lot of people sat in a room talking about drones and countermeasures because they seem to be suggesting that drones are evil, drones are going to kill us all. You know, they, have they been reading the newspaper and watching television or something? But this is ridiculous. In America, there were all these groups were in this room and there were senators and they were all discussing things. And they were talking about us. They were talking about the hobby. In fact, everything they're talking about relates to the hobby. And, but the only people who weren't represented at this meeting were, in fact, who was represented? There was the, um, the FAA, the Department of Defense, IA, well, AIA, CTA, CDA. And CDA is the, the Consumer Drone Alliance or something or other, I don't know. Anyway, a whole bunch of different groups who are all vying for control of the air in which we fly, um, and all pushing their own barrows, were represented there, talking to these senators. But where was the AMA? Where was a representative of the hobby? There was nobody from the hobby, nobody at all from the hobby, which meant we were, the, we were under discussion, but we were not represented. What does it say? Taxation without representation? Hmm, I don't know. So if you're in the USA, you need to be really, really worried about this. We are being totally sidelined and the important discussions that are going to shape the future of our hobby. Why can't we have some input? There are, if you look at the, the FAA's own records, there's probably now a million or so people who are registered to fly drones. Yet we get no input. You people get no input on this. But you've got little tiny groups like, I don't know, the, the AIA and the CTA. They've got someone at the table. They're allowed to put their case. They're allowed to argue that, oh, we must control drone, recreational drone flies because they're going to interfere with our commercial operations. Ah, uh, something smells here and I'm not happy with it. I'm going to go through some of the, or actually, first of all, go onto YouTube. You'll find that, was it, um, Chairman Bill Schuster has put a video up, uh, uh, basically a video log of the proceedings, right? He went through and he vi what, videoed the whole thing. The whole thing's been streamed and here it is recorded. I'll put a link to that very important video in the description of this one. You can go and watch the whole thing. It's two hours long or something, but you don't need to wait. I'm going to go through and raise some of the salient points that are really, really relevant. And I want you to go and think about this because if we don't, as a hobby, as a community, if we don't start putting our foot forward and saying, hey, what about us? Then we're going to wake up one morning and find that, I'm sorry, the hobby has been cancelled because Amazon want to deliver books and Domino's want to deliver pizzas and and I'm sorry there's no room for you recreational flies anymore but you you didn't say anything you, you weren't concerned you didn't say anything so why shouldn't we just wipe you from the face of the earth that's pretty crappy now let's go through this uh, this video and look at some of the really key points of things that will make you cringe and should make you very very afraid of what's happening in the USA right now okay let's look at this session it is 29 minutes into the video. Listen to this. It is important to highlight three related policies that will greatly reduce the instances of hazardous UAS operations while enhancing the effectiveness of our security partners' efforts to counter them when necessary. Universal requirements for UAS registration, remote identification, and compliance with basic airspace rules are necessary conditions for safe and secure UAS integration. The current exemption for model aircraft, Section 336 of the FAA Modernization and Reform Act of 2012, is the fundamental barrier to effective implementation of these policy changes. That woman was from the FAA, did you hear her say that Section 336 is an insurmountable barrier to stop them getting their way and being able to do the things they want to do? The FAA is, and most, or some of these other groups here, are trying to get Section 336 struck out. That's the protection that the hobby has against FAA coming in and unnecessarily regulating the hobby. And FAA is lobbying now in committees like this and groups like this to have that struck out. Be aware, where's the AMA? Why aren't they going into bat and saying, no, no, we demand the preservation of Section 336. No, FAA are clearly out to have 336 repealed. 
that is not good. Absolutely. Uh, AIA, we represent over 340 manufacturers in the aerospace and defense industry, including most of, the, uh, most of our members make uh, the avionics and the aircraft itself. So this is a very critical issue for us, and we appreciate you taking the time to cover it with us today. We at AIA absolutely support the need for law enforcement to mitigate drone threats. Um, but as these efforts ramp up and the, the increasing use of drones within the aerospace, it is important to seek input from the users and stakeholders of the aerospace. Uh, we have the experience, we have many years working in these fields, radiative fields, high intensity radiative fields, electromagnetic interference, EMI. We've done a lot of work hardening our aircraft and what we don't want to do is introduce any new risks that we are not prepared for. So, taking time to do it this correctly, as Ranking Member Larson point out, pointed out, in conjunction with the FAA, is critical, I think, to all of us in achieving the universal goal of protecting the national airspace. Right, now that guy, he's from the AIA, and he says that it's important to consult with the users of the airspace, but that doesn't include the hobby, that's just him and his mates. They represent manufacturers, well, the AIA represents manufacturers and so forth in the industry, in the drone industry. And he's talking about threats. Where are these threats? I haven't seen any single person killed or even severely damaged or injured by a recreational multi-rotor drone. But this guy's telling us there are threats and that organizations like his must be consulted. But we are the majority. The hobby is the majority by far. If you look at the amount of drone unmanned aircraft activity in the airspace, in the USA, recreational activity outweighs all the commercial activity by several orders of magnitude. Yet, the industry, the industry is being consulted and we are not. That does not make sense. We're here because drones are critical to our future. Technology has surged ahead and drones are now powerful tools for all vertical sectors of our economy. On behalf of key commercial drone industry players, the Commercial Drone Alliance works to educate because while innovation has moved quickly forward, our laws and policies have lagged behind. For the commercial drone industry to safely take off and benefit the American public, we need a systematic framework enabling development of highways in the sky, just like we have for cars and airplanes. Properly tailored counter drone authorities are important, and we have many thoughts on this, including around protecting authorized commercial drone operations and privacy. But for this framework to succeed, we need simultaneous reform of Section 336 of the 2012 Act to enable the FAA to implement basic, very basic rules of the road, including remote ID, for all UAS operators. Without this reform, there's no ability to tell friend from foe. The federal government has therefore held back the commercial drone industry, and innovation suffers. This reform is important today to automate low-altitude drone operations, but also for tomorrow to enable the future of automated human air transportation. I applaud this committee for trying to enable this exciting future in a way that is safe and secure, and I look forward to your questions. Now here's another vested interest. This woman is saying that they need repeal 336 again. She is saying 336 has to go. Um, they're all, all these groups want 336 out the window because it means that then the FAA can come in and regulate so that they have use of our airspace, the airspace we've had for decades, they can come in, basically kick us out, maybe relegate us to a few small flying fields somewhere, but other than that, we'll be gone. This woman is saying, need to repeal 336. Where's the AMA? David, can you give us any specific instances of radio wave technology interfering with commercial airliners? Thank you. Uh, so, so yes, sir. I mean, there, there have been instances where we have lost uh, due to radio waves. We believe that we've lost uh, uh, autopilot in a couple of instances in a couple of airports. Um, some of them, uh, uh, I was talking uh, yesterday with someone, Ravine, uh, recently uh, we actually had a, a grocery store a door opening and shutting that was resulting in the shutdown of the... Um, so, so is obviously, uh, radio frequency is a very... It's a very, uh, it's the black arts. Now this guy's been asked for instances where radio emissions have interfered with airliners and he tells us that radio transmissions, presumably from drones, have interfered with autopilots. Really? I mean, um, I have not heard of this. Have you heard of this? I haven't heard of this. Since when have we seen stories in the paper drone emissions affect airliners? I haven't seen it. Where, where's this crap coming from? And then he goes on to claim that a grocery door opening and shutting was affecting airport avionics. Seriously? Are they that bad? Is the design so crap? 
that a door opening and closing in a grocery store can shut down the important electronic systems required by airports? Seriously, perhaps before they start vilifying drones and kicking us out of the airspace, they need to take a close look at the technology they're using. If it's that vulnerable, then why are they worried about the little problems with people with their toy drones? Uh, let me just ask, is there uh, anybody on the panel who uh, believes that we don't uh, need to modify Section 336 uh, uh, so the FAA can impose some requirements on model aircraft? Okay, I don't see any disagreement there. Okay, well, um, moving on. Uh so now one of the committee asks all those groups present whether there's any, anyone who disagrees that they need to modify the rules around model aircraft to ensure that they can go ahead. And nobody disagrees, everyone agrees, model aircraft will have to be more regulated, have to be more controlled, probably meaning kicked out of the airspace we currently use, relegated to a few small fields in the middle of nowhere. That is what these people are saying. Again, I ask again, where's the AMA standing up saying, no, no, AMA, what are they doing? Are they asleep? I don't know. Because right now, without remote ID in place, we see a drone pop up. We have evidence in facilities of sensitive nature uh, where there's nine hobbyist organizations, AMA certified, et cetera, operating in that area. And we have drones pop up that we don't know who they are. So what, what we're doing is creating an environment where those people that are responsible for potential use of RF in the airspace uh, are forced with the decision to use it to be able to understand what's out there. And remote ID will reduce that vulnerability and risk. Now this guy's given an example. There could be nine the hobby opera organizations operating in this sensitive area and they want to be able to identify when, an air, when a model appears, whether it's friend or foe, and that's why we need this, or they want this identification system, this electronic identification system, which effectively means anyone can take a handheld device pointed at, at a model or at a drone and obviously it'll link through to the database, the registration database, give them the details of the operator, and that's what these people are after. They want to control and they want to identify. And so Basically, it means that if, if they force this upon us, if everything that flies, everything over 250 grams that flies, has to have an electronic ID tag system on it, then that's a huge burden, a huge expense on the hobby. It, when we are not the problem, how many, how many um, reports are there of people flying quarter-scale P-51 Mustangs on the approach path to an international airport? It doesn't happen. How many people are flying scale spitfires over nuclear power plants. It doesn't happen. We are not the problem. It is the idiots who are the problem, but we, the hobby, are the ones they want to regulate. They want to get rid of 336, so that effectively there is no hobby. There is no hobby. Everyone's treated equally. That's not good. Go ahead. Um, I, I would just mention on the remote ID arc report, there was actually, there was not consensus around the use of a capabilities-based approach. There was disagreement over which drones should after, who should, on the ARC, correct, yeah. Th there was not consensus on that part, on that point. From the commercial drone industry, or the commercial drone alliance perspective, we had proposed a weight-based approach, which is familiar because it's the same uh, approach as the re current registration threshold, uh, 250 grams and above, and... Um, wait, 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 say that last part. I need 250 oh, grams oh. and above is what we had proposed, although that could, that could vary, but the idea is just the heavier the vehicle. You could have a very heavy vehicle that isn't capable of flying very far, but is still in what we're designing, these highways in the sky. We're all in the same drone ecosystem flying together. So, um, you know, rather than focusing on intent or capabilities, our proposal had been focus on weight um, and give the FAA the discretion to properly regulate all UAS. Now they just raised a North uh, uh, a drone vehicle that can't go high, Mm -hmm. uh, could have the capability to do uh, radio frequency uh, jamming or screwing with it, I guess. I must say it. Is it correct? Or, so that would be a concern still or not? Now, this is pretty stupid. Um, they want to regulate models. They want to regulate all things. They want to do it by weight. So your quarter-scale Spitfire is going to need to have a, a transponder in it so to identify it, whatever. And they are talking now about radio jamming equipment in these models. I've not heard of any instance where anyone flying a model aircraft has fitted radio jamming equipment to it. 
these people are creating straw men. They're plucking stuff out of their ass and putting it up as a potential threat. Because this is this discussion is all about the threats, the threats that these drones offer and the countermeasures they can use to overcome those threats. Where are the threats? There's no evidence. Now you cannot go out there without evidence. But these guys are making stuff up on the fly and that doesn't wash. Where is the AMA saying, prove this, this is not right, this is wrong? This thing in action. Because from the FAA's perspective, we have to deal with everyone who's bringing the technology into the airspace. So consistency and a, uh, a consistent rigor of process and procedure is incredibly important to us to being able to manage um, the workload associated with the proliferation of these uh, technologies in the have system. You, yeah. Have you had any outreach uh, or any necessity? Uh, has, has it been necessary to bring in the GA, the general aviation community, in, as part of these discussions, or is this uh, as a as an airspace as an airspace user? We have not. Uh, well, uh, when the administration introduced their uh, the proposal to try to get authority for the Departments of Homeland Security and Justice uh, earlier this year, we did do outreach with a variety of what we call traditional um, airspace stakeholders, which did include general aviation, business aviation, obviously our commercial uh, air carrier partners, to walk them through um, and reassure them that the FAA has a strong coordination role, not only in where we are with DOD, DOD and DOE, but in what is envisioned for DHS and justice, um, such that they should feel reassured that the, um, you know, our focus is on mitigating impacts to um, both manned aviation and legitimate unmanned users as well. So there's the lady from the FAA again telling us how they've consulted widely with the stakeholders in this airspace, except, except the biggest single stakeholder by many orders of magnitude, the hobby flies. No consultation, nothing. And so they've spoken to the industry and the Department of Defense, all this sort of stuff. But what about us? We do not exist. In the eyes of, this, of, of the, the bureaucrats and the vested interests, the companies, the government departments, the hobby does not exist. It's a nuisance. It's an impediment. It is an insurmountable problem, not a valid user of the airspace. This, this... As you're thinking through that, how are you going to... Uh, account for the fact that for decades, uh, and rightfully so, there have been aircraft flying in what is now known as Class G airspace that aren't required to have transponders, that do carry some of this information that you're talking about. And it's never been a problem, uh, nor should it be, because it's Class G airspace, right? It's particularly airspace that is not around airports, that is not otherwise uh, heavily traveled, and that in mo in a, in a is the most vo voluminous class of airspace that we have in this country, I believe. It certainly goes to most areas of this country up to 700 feet. And I don't think anyone would stand for equip having required uh, uh, planes that fly in those areas and just in those areas to have remote ID or transponders like they don't now or anything else. So how are you going to safeguard uh, the encroachment uh, from your standards into uh, into aircraft and, and, and whether or not they have to have transponders or a remote ID? Uh, if I may, sir, uh, I think uh, when we look at remote ID from from the FAA's perspective, and, and I want to be quite clear that remote ID is not just about security. It's also about safety. As we look to expand operations, we have to have the ability for UAS to know where other UAS are, and that's so that's a key fundamental piece. But also when we talk about our security partners' stake in this, it's knowing where the, the operator is. In, um, so see and, just to cut to the chase, so see and avoid is a key component here, and you can see and avoid with aircraft in Class G. You can't see and avoid necessarily with the drones. With the drones. Go off line of sight. Correct. And, and I, I would argue that we have remote identification on every manned aircraft because we have tail numbers. Now, here's a committee member who's talking sense. He's basically saying, why are we going to expect all the drone and model flyers to have transponders when so many aircraft, manned aircraft, don't? Why should they be able to fly in Class G airspace without a transponder while you can't fly your Phantom 4 in the same piece of airspace? That's a very good question. The FAA's response is face palm because the FAA basically, as the woman says, well, they don't, they've got remote ID, they've got tail numbers. Really, isn't that great? A tail number. So, I guess in a way she's got a point, but if you can, if, it, if the aircraft isn't close enough to see the tail number, there's no way to identify it. It's like, it's a cop-out. It is a cop-out. Why should we be 
forced to do things that general aviation isn't when it's all supposedly in this in the name of safety for general aviation if they are worried let them make the changes I, I just want to add quickly um, that you know the federal government has held back on expanded operations flights beyond visual line of sight partly because there are these unidentified you know, and it's not anything about modelers there's nothing about modelers that have changed they still fly in a way that is safe um, it's just that the airspace around them has changed and so as the technology proliferates and the commercial drone yeah. industry is now um, emerging uh, you know the the rules of there just need yeah. to be some very basic rules of the road now this woman admits modelers haven't changed modelers are safe Yet, she's saying we need to have rule changes for the modelers because we're the commercial industry and we want to use the space. Now, nah. okay, I want you to watch this next bit very, very carefully because there is a member of this committee comes out to bat for the hobby. He asks what's being done to protect existing modelers and the FAA goes into a bit of a discussion and tells that they, they value the hobby and you know the, the aviation enthusiasts. Then when this guy takes it a bit further, notice that the chairman of the committee steps in and shuts him down. Now this, to me, was the single most important part of this conversation between the industry and this committee. And the chairman of the committee shut him down. I think because the chairman could see that what was gonna be said wasn't gonna look good for the committee and for the industry who basically are just saying, kick these hobbyists to the curb. And he didn't want that out there. This. This makes my blood boil when I see this. This is typical politics. This is how things are done. There's obviously, there's probably lobbyists in there kicking them saying, shut them down, shut them down. Not good enough. And again, I have to ask the question I've been asking all the way through this. Where the hell is the AMA? Where's the representation for the hobbyist? You can see that the hobby is getting ripped apart. It's getting torn apart by people with commercial interests. These groups that are all sitting on the far side of the table with their commercial interests, they want what we have had. They want that zero to 400 feet. They want it for themselves. They don't want pesky modelers involved. They'll pay lip service to, oh no, no, we value the hobby. But they want to repeal section 336, which means the FAA can step in and basically regulate the hobby almost out of existence. As I said, if you want to go flying, there'll be a few little pockets of areas where you can fly, little fields way out in the middle of nowhere. Forget about your park flying. Forget about, you know, mini quad flying and bando flying that will all be fall under the auspices probably of department of defense and if you are caught bando flying or flying in a park you'll probably end up in prison i mean this is really really bad so i don't know what you guys in america do i really don't know where you go from here you can see how much crap you're in look at the crap you're in now when the, the politicians are just paying lip service to the democratic process the industry is just rolling out its pitch and it's being sucked up. I mean, one guy, when one guy stands up for the hobby, he gets shut down by the chairman of the committee because it doesn't suit the agenda, the unspoken agenda that's obviously in place here. My good friend, Mr. DeFazio mentioned 336 and he referenced modelers and said, do any of you think that 336 doesn't need to be changed? And again, he referenced modelers. It made me it left me with the impression that you all thought something was wrong with what modelers were doing. So I want to go into more detail here. Why, what have modelers done or not done that make them need to, that we need to change 336 to affect modelers? FAA? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you for, for digging deep, more deeply into that question. Uh, as you rightly point out, um, the around 200,000 or so modelers that exist out there today have been flying safely. They are aviation enthusiasts. The challenge, as Ms. Elman... They're artists, they're scientists. Most of the astronauts that have flown on the space shuttle and other missions have been modelers themselves. A absolutely, sir. And many people who can no longer do manned flight choose to do modeling um, as a way, again, to keep that uh, love of aviation, which we absolutely um, uh, prize along with them. However, the environment in which they're operating has changed. Uh, and the, pro the challenge with um, Section 336 is it, add, it lends ambiguity and nuance where that has led to noncompliance. That is to say, we have probably five to 700,000 um, additional UAS that are registered as mod as hobbyists or recreationalists. So what are we going to do that, to protect the people who haven't done anything wrong as, well, as as the airspace gets more complicated? If 
if um, 336 were repealed or significantly changed, um, the FAA has not taken a heavy-handed approach with modelers in the past. Understood. So what are your comp what are your comments in this regard? Yeah, excuse CTA me, first. Excuse me. Uh, very quickly, we can go to round two. Okay. But we got a lot of members who want to ask questions. So whoever was going to go next, and then we'll go to the next one. And that's fine. I was done with my questioning. So there you go. If you live in America and you fly models, you should be crapping yourself right now. And this is this is a rant that, you know, needed to be made. So I'd like your feedback on this. How do we counter this? How does the hobby counter these people, these politicians, these commercial groups, the FAA who are all out there to stab us with knives? Tell us how you think we should deal with this. Um, I. The only solution I can think of is creating a body to represent us all. And the FAA admitted there are five to seven hundred thousand new UAS operators. That's people with Phantoms and Mavics and whatever. They don't, they don't have a representative body. The, the old school hobby has the AMA, but where is it? They might as well not have the AMA because the AMA is just, I don't know, are they all mint juleps in the middle of summer somewhere and wherever the AMA headquarters is? They are missing in action and there's no one representing the other people. I don't know that obviously starting a new group, starting a representative group would be the thing to do, but who's going to do that? And even if you do start a representative group, the five to seven hundred thousand drone operators, some of them may only use their drone once or twice a year. They're not going to bother paying money to join a group. And they're probably not even going to bother with the politics of it. They don't care. It doesn't affect them yet. And they will, by the time it affects them, it'll be too late. That's always been the case. That's how these things work. Now, the politicians have it all over us because they know divide and conquer. And at the moment, we are just a sea of individuals. We are a sea of individuals. And any individual can be smacked down very easily. A group, a unified group that represents a million people, much harder to deal with. But we don't have that in the USA or anywhere in the world, really. Well, actually, tell a lie. Look at the UK. FPV UK is representing FPV flies. They've got some really good dispensations. They can fly to a thousand feet in the UK, whereas the Great Unwashed can only fly to 400. Why isn't America doing this? Why aren't you working hard? When Section 336 goes, and it will go, you can see from this it's gonna go, the hobby is lost. The hobby, as we know it, is lost. So there you go. Um, I hope this creates some discussion. Talk to you amongst yourselves in the comments. I'll be listening, I'll be watching. And um, spread the word about this. I think a lot of people didn't see this, didn't know this happened. They're just completely unaware. Don't be unaware. Otherwise, you'll be very nastily surprised when things change overnight. There you go. My rent. A rent. Another Ashjet rent from the editing studio. Haven't been here before, have you? No. There you go. Questions, comments in the usual place. Thank you for watching. Now I've got to get on. I've got screeds of video to edit up. And it's raining, so what better things to do than edit up video? Thanks for watching. Bye for now.